lesser measure, which is what you're trying to, to, to come to. Your Honor, Mr. Spencer read to you Rule 1.05. I don't know if you've looked at that. That's what they're asking you to sign an order on. 1.05 says any information about the client in the course of representation. So they're applying that to Mr. Rathbun. That's part of the problem is in the course of representation yeah. as opposed to in the course of employment. And right. Those are two distinct different things. And he's not a lawyer, didn't represent him. I, and I've been wrestling with that. So as it is written now, literally, we could not talk to Marty Rathbun about anything that happened in 30 years at the Church of Scientology. And by the way, we're back here again. They're arguing compellingly that there's this confidential information. They have yet to identify one piece of confidential information. And I understand they, they claim they don't have to do it, and somebody's going to trade my picture later on. Right. So, but having this debate, I understand the framework of the debate. I'm trying to come up with a good way to do it. The only way I know now to do it, make it as clear as possible. Change it to be privileged information, striking the definition under 105, and then leaving the rest of life. But I mean, number number two, I see that it being while he's testifying in front of me or a jury. I'm okay with that. Well, except he uses the same definition. We can agree to your honor if we say privileged information. They have the confidential in quotes there to come back to their definition under 105A. If we take anywhere they have quoted confidential information, if we substitute privileged, attorney-client privileged information in there for one, two, three, and five, we've already told them we can live with that. Well, I'm not looking at only being an attorney-client privilege. It could be work product. It could be trade secrets. It could be other categories. So, I mean, but maybe. At least that gives us some guidance, your honor. Privileged in more general terms. But one, two, and three is privileged information. When it says confidential, that makes it a lot simpler. For me, at least. And then number four. I mean, I would limit it right now to being an expert witness. I don't want to start debating what does it mean to advise or consult. Again, we're talking about a spouse of a party that had some high-level involvement with the defendant nine or ten years ago. And I see number five as really being unmanageable. But unless you limit it to privilege, if you limit it to privilege, it's probably pretty manageable. I mean, I have absolutely no problem with number six. But right now, we need to order that affidavit sealed as part of the file and not disseminate it further without an order of the court. Is there a problem with that? There is a problem. I think they complied with 76A. In order to seal a record that's already public, I've never done it before, but as I read the rule, they've got to provide notice to newspapers. There's public interest concerns. I haven't just come up with one stuff in Dallas. There's a number of items they've got to comply with in order to seal it. Okay, well, as far as you all further disseminating it, is there any problem with that? I was taking it further than what they were asking. Well, we may need to use it in another plea. That's the problem. I mean, all you've got to do is refer to it. Or people come and ask you for permission. Well, so we may be amending our response to the special appearance. We would be attached to the inclusion of that. You can attach that under seal without going through a process to seal the courtroom. 
He's talking about sealing the core. You, know, uh, you can attach it under seal. Uh, under the general, the general rule, Your Honor, that you have the right to run your courtroom how you think you need to. That gives you the, the authority to do that. Not according I to Rule 76A. I think he's talking about the papers in the file. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's not in the file. He's going to be filing something new, Your Honor. But it's already there. Well, well then, here's what the rule says. I'm sorry. If it's already there, I understand what the rule says. Right. I'm, I'm suggesting that the court has a plenary power to say, when you file a new thing and you want to add something that I've told you not to further disseminate, even if it's a copy of what you've already done, file that under seal. Or just got refer the power to it by reference. Or refer to it by reference. reference. You've got the power to reference. do that. You have the power to do that without publishing the newspaper that you're going to shut things down. Here's my, I'm not an appellate specialist here. I read the rule on special appearance responses and any affidavits or things we've got to attach. It's got to be seven days before the hearing. So if it was just me and the abundance of caution, I, when I filed that amended response, I would attach that affidavit again because I don't know what the court appeals is going to say. So that's my concern. But if you feel like you need to attach it, I don't have any opposition to you. It's just, it's a habit. Don't worry. Hollow ceiling since it's all right, already in here, but the purpose of preserving the record for any appellate review, if you want to attach it in an envelope late in the day or whatever, I don't have a problem with that. Well, it is done and it is attached and it is in the record. What more? Normally happens. That affidavit is several pages long. I think they're only complaining about a paragraph or two. You don't get to seal an entire affidavit just because you're going to object to one or two paragraphs. They ask to redact or to seal those particular portions. I don't think it's proper to just say the whole affidavit is now sealed forevermore. Well, the whole issue about sealing, I volunteer. Forget I ever mentioned it. Just don't disseminate it any further beyond four or five. We have the power to do that. Judge, just to be clear. As well as any state statute or rule or other common law. State common law. Okay. Privilege in regards to anything else today? Well, we do have the matter of the protective order and view of your ruling. That's the big protective order that sets up the framework. In view of your ruling, we did submit to you a proposed order that excludes the spouse or includes the spouse as. For the purposes of these jurisdictional issues, which is really the threshold, or that's as far as we've got. Right now, I'm okay with adding the spouse. But just with everybody's understanding, once we get beyond that, I'm probably going to go right back to the standard language from the Fifth Circuit. And do you have a copy of the order up there with the spouse, or do you want us to give you another copy? We have it right here. We just need something signed because they're not giving us any discovery until we get it signed. Okay. I don't know. It may be up here somewhere. Yes, I have another copy. But we didn't put it. And I'm happy to substitute the signature on it. Your Honor, Mr. Jeffers representing, and we're accepting his representation, that the sole and exclusive change he's made in this order from when we prepared is that he added the words, and the party's spouse on page 2, section D, double small i. That's correct, Your Honor. And also, to take care of your issue about the signature line, although they're not signing off on it, we'll stipulate that they're not waiving their special appearance by – Well, they're not signing off on it. Well, they're both not signing off on it. Do you want an oral order? Are they signing off on yours? I don't think they have to. Yeah, and they don't. That's the case. Well, 
I've signed this and whoever else wants to sign. <laughs> Yours is the only important signature. And we can get a copy of that from Savannah. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, thank you. Thank you.